And a very, very warm good afternoon to you if you've just joined us. Welcome to the second Nexus for the day. Nexus, of course, our series um, specifically designed to create uh, connection and networking amongst uh, the industry. Um, I, I like to give people a little bit of time to find their feet, to figure out their way around the platform. Um, I want to just say a very warm welcome. Welcome to my colleagues from Private Property. Welcome Jan from PayProp. Welcome Michelle, welcome Quad, welcome Tando, your head welcome to you again. Sindiswa, good afternoon and welcome as well. Putty McDonald, I see you there. Welcome, welcome to Nexus. Let's give it a few more minutes to see if we're going to have more people joining us. Templeton is on my table. He's from Expello and he already said uh, hello to, to us. Hi, Toya. I see you. Hi, Hesti Marie Swanapool. I see you too. Welcome to Nexus. Welcome, Ken. Ken from Yarvitz in the Midlands, KZN. Good afternoon to you, Ken, and thank you so much for taking time out of this Monday afternoon to join us. We're very, very thrilled to have you here. Hi, Lee. How are you, Miss Lee Holling? And Ben. Hello, thank you for helping me do this thing today. Sarvas, good afternoon to you. Cristal, good afternoon. And I think that's everyone that I've greeted so far. Actually, there's uh, Thea Garage from Prime uh, Property Musgrave. Also, welcome to you, Tremaine Naidu. I see you there. Welcome to Linda, Denise Manley. Welcome to Private Properties Nexus. Um, Nasheen Nathan, welcome to you as well. I think let's give it a few more minutes and then we get started. There's quite a bit to get through through today. Hi, uh, hi, is it Craig? Craig Jason Wood from uh, Ian Wiles Auctioneers. Welcome, Craig, and uh, and thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Gugu from Amanzam Toti. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Please use this chat facility here, the chat box here, to engage, say hello to your colleagues, say hello to some of your uh, fellow uh, compatriots. Hello, Shirley from Harcourts. Hi, Lorraine Lafferty. I see you there, Fiona Crago, or Coletta saying hi to Fiona. Okay, I think let's get cracking. We've got quite a bit to get through, but... Before we get started, let me start by just saying good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this our first series of Nexus. Over the next few days, we're going to be um, presenting a couple of these uh, engagement opportunities. I'm Tracy Lee Miller, and I'm the Brand and Marketing Executive at Private Property, and I will be your virtual host for this afternoon's session. Um, the word nexus, as you may know, actually means a series of connections linking two or more things. And that is exactly what the nexus events are about. It's a series of digital networking events, events which cultivate people connection through knowledge sharing and networking. Our first nexus was hosted in November last year, very well received by the industry. It had a, a much more national focus. So this time around, we decided to bring it back, make it a bit bigger and better than before. And one way that we're doing this is by tailoring the events to specific regions so that the insights we share and discuss are hyper relevant to you in your area, giving you the best possible chance of achieving success even in this tough market. So I have a couple of things to share with you before we go on. There's a chat box to the right hand side of the screen. Please use it to engage with us during the event. Also, you'll be able to see right at the end of that um, 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 bar, there's a Q&A. If you click on Q&A, you can ask a question. So I'm gonna ask, ask a question in here. What is your favorite, favorite color? And then can um, um, your favorite color and let's say uh, if someone thinks that this question is a good enough question that needs to be upvoted, I'm going to ask that question anonymously. 
um, you can upvote the question. I'm not sure who upvoted it, but we then can see at the end of the session whether this is actually a question that um, we need to get answered by the presenter. But use the Q&A to almost park your questions because we're not going to ask questions through while the people are talking. So that's the first one. The other one that I need for you to remember is this is very engaging. So we have something called a Mentimeter. And for that, we're going to ask you to have your cell phones close at hand. Make sure that it's fully charged. We'll give you the, the website that where you can find Menti, menti.com, and then we'll play a, a little game. The other one that I think is important for me to mention to you here is that we have one and a half non-verifiable CBD points, CPD points on offer from AISA. Thank you. And to get these points, please stick around until you get to the end of the session, and then we'll drop the link where you can register and go and get those points. All right, I think we are Fiona Jean Prego. Your favorite color is blue. Hello, Solly, I see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I believe it's a bit hot over there in KZN. I'm all the way out here in uh, Gauteng, in fact, very close to uh, to Wits, so in somewhere, somewhere in downtown Bramfontein. Okay. I want to maybe see, let me know where you're watching from. If you haven't already told me, just give me a sense of where you're watching from. This morning's session, we actually had someone watching all the way from the UK, wanting to just get a better understanding of the market in the area that the region that we presented. Hello, Carl. I see you there. Can you tell me where you're from? Bluff. I see, ooh, it's going so fast, I can't even keep up. Your head all the way in Stellenbosch. Okay, look at that. So we've got people from all over the KwaZulu-Natal area here today. Of course, private property has a very special relationship with this province. It is the province of our brand's birth more than 22 years ago. How many of you, last question, then we're going to get um our first speaker on the on the mariana your favorite color is pink i get i got you i got you and the beautiful zimbali masal you're joining us from zimbali impangeni for chantal and tyson bluff for quad linda pele you're at rawson bluff okay i got you awesome awesome stuff great stuff right i think studio if we can get our first speaker to, uh, to the stage. The speaker this afternoon, of course, is APSA's regional manager. Um, her name is Venusha Naidu. She's the regional manager for home loans, KZN. I met her last week when we were doing the dry run. I think she's going to have so much interesting insights to share with us. And without further ado, Venusha, we can hear you clearly. I'm going to put my microphone on mute. I'll put my camera off. I'm always here. All right. Enjoy the session, guys. Thank you so much, Tracy. Really, really appreciate that very, very warm welcome. And I think it's most fitting because I come to you live from the most warmest province in the country. So very excited to be here with you all today. Um, so I think as Tracy mentioned, I am Venusha. I look after the APSA Home Loans Franchise in KZN, and I am so, so excited to be here with you all today on this virtual stage. It would have been really nice for us to see each other face to face in province, staring out over into the Indian Ocean, but I think this is going to have to do for now because we must put safety first. And I think before we go on, I just want to say a huge thank you to our strategic partners, Tracy and the rest of the team from Private Property, for having me here today and for hosting such an awesome event once again. If we could please move on to the next slide, thank you. Perfect. So guys, if you see this slide, don't panic. So 2020, wow, what a year, right? And what a journey it has been for all of us. The year that we coined is 2020. I remember when we were celebrating New Year, for 2020, we said, oh, this is going to be 2020, a year that was going to be generous for all of us. 
However, I don't think any of us anticipated how those last 12 months would have unfolded for us. COVID-19 has had a huge impact, not only on our property industry, but on our province, our country, and to the world at large. And I think for us here in KZN, we were very, very unfortunate to have seen quite a bit of devastation. I mean, I think most of you can relate. Do you remember driving through the coastline or on the M4 during December and seeing that emptiness on our beaches? That was extremely, extremely sad and heartbreaking. If I had to look back to exactly a year ago, we were getting ready to go into lockdown level five. What was level five? It was a concept unknown to us. And for this industry in particular, it meant a complete shutdown. It meant that you and I were unable to do what we love doing for two whole months. Those months also required us to rethink what was important as well as find a way and navigate life in a huge pandemic. I'm sure over the past year as well, we all know somebody or know of somebody who has lost a loved one. I think before we go on to the next well, it would be really remiss of me to not remember our late King Goodwill's Velatini, our Zulu King who lost his life a few days ago. May his soul rest in peace. So what exactly did 2020 and the COVID pandemic mean for the property industry? I would like to call this slide the tale of two halves, two very, very opposing halves, actually. So if you looked at the first half of the year, or what we would call half one or H1, we were seen in a situation where it was really a downturn and a detract in the economy. And we saw our application volumes drop at an unprecedented 9% decline when being compared to 2019. However, it was not all doom and gloom because as we moved on to H2, we saw a really, really different picture. Quite the opposite, actually. It was very remarkable for us to witness property sales bounce back in the second half of the year, and I'm sure you all felt that way. In a way, when we were taken out of the industry for that two-month period, it was something that was unprecedented. To be honest, it felt like a scene from a movie. But as we got into age two, we saw our application volumes grow by 36%. I remember moments last year in H2 where we had to actually just sit, reflect, and breathe. It was very exciting to see those volumes in the pandemic because I think when we got into March and April last year, we actually thought, okay, guys, what is this? Is it doom, gloom, doom and gloom? Is it doomsday? So I think it was quite remarkable to almost see that shift. From a KZN-specific perspective, we saw a decline of 9.2% in H1 and the recovery of just under 20% in the second half of the year. In addition, I think from a deeds office perspective, we saw this growth in activity translate into greater registrations within the second half of the year. And that registrations in H2 equated to more than double the number of registrations that we saw in H1. Another very interesting point to share, because bearing in mind that we were in a pandemic and there were COVID challenges, we did not see a decline in the quality of customer coming through the door last year. We were actually seeing the quality of customer holding out as we entered H2. As a bank, this was very pleasing for us because it enabled us to keep our approval rates in line with those of pre-lockdown level. Yes, you heard correctly, pre-lockdown levels. This then drove our surge of registrations in the second half of the year. So from an industry perspective, you can really see why I call this slide the tale of two halves. Because firstly, we saw a dramatic downturn in the first half of the year, and then an even more dramatic increase in the second half of the year. If anything, I think this tale is truly testament to the resilience of the human spirit and turning a negative into a positive. If we can go on to the next slide, please. So while all of this was happening, we were all sitting back and watching everything unfold in front of us. It was exciting. The activity in the market, it was phenomenal. But what exactly did this tell us about our customers and what they were thinking? What was guiding their thought process as they went through this pandemic and ultimately what led their purchases? 
This brings us to the next slide, which is known as our Home Ownership Sentiment Index, also affectionately known to us at APSA as the APSA HSI. The most exciting part of this index was to watch the movement of our customers across different types as well as different provinces. So essentially what this index is, it's a test of our customers' confidence in the property market. Very, very pleasing for us to see was at the end of last year, customer confidence was at the highest. But wait for it, guys. The real gem here to come out of this index was that it was not the highest just for 2020. It was the highest since the inception of the index, which was in 2015. And bearing in mind, all of this happening in the middle of a pandemic, ladies and gents, simply amazing. Now, when looking at the index, there are two factors to consider what we call the demand side and the supply side. Both of these factors contributed to the increase we saw in customer confidence at the end of last year. Firstly, if we are to look at the demand side, there were two points to consider. One being the ability of property to increase in value over time. Secondly, our current low interest rate cycle, which made debt financing more affordable. And when we cross over to the supply side, we have seen confidence originating from resilient house prices the second point to consider has to definitely be the renewed motivation by owners to invest in their own properties. The conversation here we can see of renovations taking importance. Ultimately, a combination of this led to the increase in confidence by 4% at the end of last year, ending off the year with an overall national sentiment at 80%. From a KZN perspective, we do not fare off very far from the national sentiment of 80%, with KZN ending the year with an overall sentiment of 77%. If we can go on to the slide per region, please. We now take a look at the overall sentiment from a regional perspective, taking into account our large metro areas, that being KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, and the Western Cape. It is most pleasing to see across all big metros, all of the metros have shown an increase in the overall sentiment. We must acknowledge the notable increase of 10% by our sister province, the Western Cape, in comparison to prior years. A huge factor to consider here would be that of immigration. This drive to the sentiment could attribute to customers having the need to work from anywhere they want to virtually. At the heart of this is definitely the decision of lifestyle and the ease of a comfortable work from home environment. Let's be honest, guys. Who wouldn't want to glimpse out at the Indian Ocean whilst you logged on to an MS Teams call or a Zooms meeting? I would definitely want to look at that view. Gauteng, however, remained the region with the highest sentiment at 81%. This was evidenced by the largest increase in applications coming in via Gauteng last year. From a KZN perspective, as mentioned, we came in at 77%, with us being just 3% under the national sentiment and up by 6%. Particular points of interest for KZNR, there was a 78% uh, sentiment of buying over renting. Ultimately, the question of why you can rent if you can, why rent if you can buy is a factor to consider. The sentiment was 76% towards investing, and we all know that property is a solid asset to invest in. This, coupled with our low interest rate cycle, made investing a very appealing option for our customers. We also saw an increase in renovations, once again adding to the need to make lifestyle choices while work from home became more of a permanent reality. A comfortable work environment in a pandemic definitely taking center stage here as we all got used and accustomed to being more at home than going out. In addition, from a KZN perspective, we saw quite a bit of movement to our coastal areas such as the South Coast. This gave customers great value for money coupled with the appealing lifestyle of a coastal offering. Another factor to consider was our KZN climate. We now look at homeowner sentiment by customer type. We looked at the four types as mentioned on the graph in front of you. We can see across all customer types, we've seen an improvement in the sentiment by the end of the year, thus boosting overall confidence. The two customer types that really stood out is very interesting were the existing homeowners, which was the orange line, as well as on the investors, which was the dark purple line. Existing homeowners have always lagged behind the others, most likely due to a lower than expected financial benefit 
having already gone through the process of buying and selling property. However, they are customers who have seen the greatest growth in the sentiment from the end of 2019 to the end of 2020 with a 10% increase. Noteworthy to mention is that where the sentiment was in Q1 of 2020 to the change at the end of last year. Once again, driven by the new ways of work, the lifestyle impact of lockdown, where we all are looking for homes with study, a bigger garden for kids, where there isn't an urgent need to be as close to work as normal with most of South Africa working from home. Obviously, we must take into account our low interest rates. The investor segment had the highest drop in sentiment in the heart of lockdown, which was around Q1, as investors chose not to add to their property portfolios and adopted a wait and see approach. This was very understandable with what was happening. It was heavily influenced by economic activity and the uncertainty in the market, as well as a sharp increase in rental defaults as customers faced lockdown pressures. This was also the time in the market where the banks introduced payment relief initiatives. However, this investment segment has bounced back and returned to the top with the highest sentiment, likely above first-time home buyers who drove most of the surge in activity last year. If there's one thing the slide teaches us, it's that 2020 was definitely the year to get into property. From a KZN perspective, we saw the following, a rise in investor purchases, predominantly in our coastal spots, once again tying into the concept of semigration and the choice of a coastal lifestyle. We saw an inflow of first-time home buyers and predominantly female as well. We noticed that the popular suburbs for first-time home buyers were in the Durban Central Precinct, Morningside, Essenwood, and the Windermere area, definitely a focus on areas that are centrally located. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Okay, if we had to look at a buying versus a selling sentiment, the sentiment towards buying property, which is the top red line in red, returned to 2019 pre-COVID levels by mid-year last year. You can see that came into effect around July last year and ended 8% higher with a year-on-year -year comparison. I think this was also the time when the industry was allowed back into, into trading and when lockdown levels had dropped. This is the main driver between the increase in interest rates in property, interest in properties. I'm also sure you experienced this in the market and you experienced this last year as well. We must, however, note the bottom line where the sentiment towards selling has still not recovered to 2019 levels. This has decreased by 7% year on year. Whilst we do note the gradual improvement, we are still not at pre-lockdown levels. This means that the gap between wanting to sell and wanting to buy continues to widen, meaning that at this point in time, there are more willing buyers in the market than there are willing sellers. We have seen the impact the continuation of property prices in the market, specifically in our lower segments of 750 to 1.5, which is where most of the activity occurred. It is also placing a huge pressure on stock in this price, which may result in property prices starting to increase. Purchase prices have in general been higher as buyers have been reaching to more expensive properties given the improvements in affordability resulting from our low interest rate cycle as well as we anticipate that activity starts to increase into the next price band. From a KZN perspective, we have felt the pressure of stock already, predominantly in our lower price bands. These are the properties we know that are on the market for a few days and sell within days of being listed. This is a trend that may creep into our higher price bands as well as, as stock concerns start to become a bigger focus. So what does the future hold for us? What is our crystal ball of property saying for all of us and for our industry? If we can go on to the next slide, we will now come on to the topic of interest rates. I think that is key for anybody right now, interest rates. So we have established by now that the low interest rate cycle has been the driver of positive sentiment and the coincidental increase in home purchases. The age-old adage of strike while the iron is hot is very true now, and in this case, the iron most definitely is low interest rates. We believe that although the interest rate cycles have essentially reached the bottom of the cycle, they will remain at current levels until Q4 of this year before they gradually start to rise. The rise, however, will be so gradual 
that our interest rates will not have recovered to pre-lockdown levels by the time we get to the end of 2023. Next slide, please. House prices. So we now find ourselves in what is a demand and supply scenario at play. The recent developments in supporting an increase in the number of willing buyers has placed an upward pressure in, in, in the prices that are coming through of, of, our, of our properties. However, how much of that will be supported by an increase is yet to be seen. Once again, the conversation topic of, is this a buyer's market or is this a seller's market? Purchase prices in general have been higher as buyers have been reaching to buy more expensive properties given the improvements in affordability, taking into account our low interest rate cycle. We would now look at market growth per province. If you look at the red bars at the bottom, reflecting market growth for the 2020 period, we can see that across the board, all regions performed lower than 2019, demonstrating that despite the amazing recovery we had in H2, it was not sufficient enough to recover year on year in comparison to 2019. Once again, drawing your attention to the tale of two halves. The top row shows the predictions for 2021, which were calculated at the end of last year. We can see that the expectations are positive across all the regions for 2021, with a particular note to our region and noting the 4% growth expected for 2021. However, in many cases, the moment we saw the coming in of 2020, our applications in December were up 47% versus 2019. So we think the market may even grow a bit more than what we have predicted. After full two months of performance in 2021, we can say that our application volumes are continuing to be resilient, up 21% versus February last year before the pandemic, guys. There is still a level of uncertainty in forecasting these models, however, for the year ahead. We will also have to note our deeds office closures arising in some of our regions, and with the possibility of a third wave, there is some uncertainty. I think it's safe at this point, guys, to say that all of our crystal balls are a little murky at this point in time. However, from a KZN perspective, we do remain hopeful for the next couple of months, and as a region, we were quite hit significantly by the impact of COVID, as well as deeds office closures. We are thankful that 2021 has gone off to a better start and we remain cautiously optimistic. We are not superstitious people, but we keep our fingers crossed nonetheless. And I think the one thing that holds true, however, and something that we have seen throughout the heart of this pandemic last year, is that the South African dream of owning your own home remains a core aspiration. And it is where your roots are placed where you teach your child to ride his bike for the first time, where you create your memories and ultimately it's your safe haven. And ladies and gentlemen, all of you here today continue to make the dreams of South Africans come through. So on behalf of APSA, on behalf of APSA KZN, a huge thank you to all of you for assisting us and partnering with us on this journey. We as APSA Home Loans continue to aspire the nation, continue to aspire to house the nation and shape the industry in a meaningful way. Thank you so much to Private Property for allowing me, allowing me this platform on this virtual stage. Over to you, Tracy. Thank you so much, Venusha. I was looking at some of the chats uh, that came in while you were talking. Uh, some people just saying hi, Becky from Durban in particular saying hi. Um, we have one question. Thank you, Venusha, for keeping time as well. Excellent job. Um, I think we'll have, we have two questions. Someone's asking what time does the event end today? We're aiming to end in an hour from now and then hopefully keep networking open for another 30 minutes. But the formal program, we're pushing for it to be um, complete, concluded by half past three today. And then Ken had a question. <clears throat> In a country plagued by planned service delivery failures, such as load shedding, which we're all kind of sitting on the edge of our seat, hoping not to get uh, hit, when, when will banks start to get behind funding homeowners who want solar power solutions installed at their properties? Great question there from Ken. Venusha, do you want to take a stab at answering that question? I'll put my microphone off and leave my camera. Sure, no problem. 
we do actually have a, a division within EPSA that is our renewable energy division within our relationship banking structure. So we have already assisted customers with these solar energy panels. Um, it's been quite successful in our agri space as well in the Western Cape. We've had quite a bit of success. Ken, I will post my, my information onto the chat. So if you would want to contact me afterwards, this is something that I could easily arrange a discussion for you with, with our team at our head office from the renewable energy side. I will gladly facilitate that for you. Thank you so much, Venusha. I'm going to let Venusha get into the limo and go back to her table if there are no further questions. But thank you. Thank you so much for, for spending this afternoon with us. Really, really appreciate it, Venusha. Thank you so much, Tracy. Excellent. Right now, let's uh, have a little bit of fun for the next five minutes. I want you to take out your cellular devices and go to www.menti.com. Enter the code 456-28137. 456-28137. Put in your name and then we'll get ready to answer some questions and the point of this part of our program is to really get to know who's in the room in much more detail than we would have in the past if we were just having a physical event with you there you know let's enter your name enter the code enter your name and then we can get ready for for this set of um questions i see carl van der berg is already there my colleague celeste is in already lee you're in too tremaine you're in ken i see you're in dana you're in uh let me see if there are any other questions nothing for now let's get a few more people in here tracy dunn is asking for us to put the code in here studio on it did you check that studio is just literally on it like that? Well done, studio. The code is 45628137. 45628137. Leanne is asking, what's the code again? It's in the chat, 45628137. Thanks, Gugu, for helping us with that. All right, I think we've got quite a number of people in already. If you're not in yet, you'll catch us on the flip side. I think let's get ready studio to answer these questions. I want to try and get us through the program in good time because time is completely of the essence with these virtual events. That's what we found. So the first question is, what is your job title or your role within your company? Where are you joining us from? There we go. A state agent, mostly most of the people that are here are with us in their capacities as uh, real estate agents or property professionals. There's a few others. I remember your head, your, your other is also there. A few CEOs, principal agent and managing broker studio. Let's go to the next question. The next question is my favorite question out of the series is, do you multitask when attending virtual meetings or virtual events online? Yes, I'm guilty. The second option is my mind does tend to wander. The third option is no, I'm 100% focused. And then the fourth option is sometimes. So most of you saying between sometimes and yes, I'm guilty. I think it probably also has to do with the content. Am I right? Let's see. There, there's more responses coming through. Let's get to the next question. Hey, Kay Rushton, principal agent. Thank you, Karen, for letting us know. Karen, you multitask. It's so difficult. We're doing 10, 10 things at once. Here's another question. In your opinion, is it a buyer's or a seller's market? What do you think? Buyer's or seller's market? Sasha, and I see you doing 10 things at once, 100%. That's, that's exactly right for, for me anyway, personally. I tend to, you know, be all over the place, except when I'm, when I'm hosting and I literally have to spend my 100% focus on you. So seller's market, but the majority of you thinking that more, it's more a buyer's market. There was a third 
proposal or proposal for a third option, which was both, and that came out this morning in this morning session. Let's get to the next question. And then I'm going to ask my next speaker to start getting themselves ready. In the next minute or so, we're going to bring on um, pay props, your head and Jan. And um, I really encourage you to stick around for Jan's particular talk. He he has some very interesting information to share with you. Shoo! That's the word that describes 2021. So if I'm not saying 2020, I'm saying 2021. Busy. Difficult and challenging, amazing, a roller coaster, but hopeful. Okay, somebody said tequila. <laughs> Please tell me in the chat what you mean by a tequila year. My goodness, anything can happen. I think that speaks into that hopeful, positive, promising, amazing, challenging, busy, excellent, crazy. Thank you so much for sharing your sentiment of 2021 so far. Let's go to the next question. If you have one thing about the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? I know you had to think about that a little bit, but uh, let's see some of those responses coming through. If you could change just one thing about the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? Yep. This uh, commission percentage, someone says more stock, someone says compliance. Quite a few of you saying you would change the EAAB. Uh, overpricing is one of the, one of the um, comments there. Deeds offers to be more efficient, of course. Quicker transfer times, of course, that's something that we hear often. Allow repairs in, bond amount, in the bond amount. Um, efficiency of rates department, more stock, prop tech, more stock, um, and the EAAB, no show houses. Who said no show houses? Please put your comment in the chat and explain what, what you mean by no show houses. Um, and there we have strictly do away with unqualified agents and introduce more of the interactions with EAAB. Let's go to the thank you, everyone, for giving us your your opinion, for giving us your input, your feedback. Um, I, I don't think there are any other questions here specific to the mentee component of this program, but I am going to bring up, um, in fact, we're going to take a, a short five minute break. And in this five minute break, um, please switch on your camera if you if you can. Um, switch on your microphone if you can. When you do that, then everyone in your table is visible to you. If you don't switch on your camera and your microphone, you'll still be able to hear the conversation from the colleagues who have actually switched on their, their cameras. The other interesting thing about this particular platform is you can actually jump from table to table. So if you look at the, the, the letter inside the, inside the circle on the table, it will tell you the name and surname of the of the participant or the delegate. And if there's space at the table, you'll be able to then connect. So I'm going to give, let's, studio, let's come back in five minutes. And then we'll bring on Payprop, Yohet and Jan, followed by our, our private properties, Carl van der Berg. And he will end the session off for us today. In the next five minutes, I'll see you here. We are back. Awesome. Thank you, studio. Welcome back, everyone. Up next, we have Payprop Head of Data and Analytics, Yohet Smith. And Smuts and the CEO of Payprop, Jan Davo, will be taking us through the 2020 rental market in review and what the future holds. They'll also be giving us a sneak peek at the Payprop's in a state of the rental market survey results before everyone else. So we're, it's really very special. Um, studio, let's bring, oh, there you are, your hit. Welcome, welcome to the stage. Welcome, Johan. Welcome, Jan, as well. We'll see Jan in a, in a few minutes. Um, enjoy the session. Over to you. 
Thank you, Tracy, and thanks again, Private Property, for hosting us. Um, it's always fun to be part of your events um, and to share some of our knowledge and insights into the rental market with you. I'm going to share my screen now, and then I'm going to switch off my video just um, so that, let me just find the right screen. I'm going to switch off my video so that the presentation can be large enough on everyone's screens because there are quite a few graphs in there. All right, that is the right screen. As Tracy said, um, Jan and I will be chatting to you about the year in review. So that's my section. And then Jan will tell you a bit about what to expect in the future. So for today, I'm going to chat to you about um, information from the rental index. I'll share the link in the chat in a bit. Um, and show the link at the end of this presentation, but we'll go through what happened with rent and rental growth, what happened to arrears, what does the credit metrics look like, and then, as Tracy mentioned, the sneak peek of the state of the rental industry survey that literally no one, well, no one has seen yet, um, except for the Nexus group this morning. Um, so I hope that you find it insightful. So, Starting off with the rental market. In this first, first graph, we look at inflation, that's the blue line, and national uh, rental growth, that's the red line. So what we measure here is year-on-year -year rental growth. Um, and as you can see, that has trailed below inflation for most of the past two years. That's the period that we're looking at here. You can also see that the red line, the rental growth line, has been trending downward for some time. And in November, we saw negative rental growth year on year for the first time since we started the rental index back in 2012. So what this means is that between November 2019 and November 2020, the average rent amount that we see on Payprop actually became cheaper was only 10 Rand or 0.3% cheaper, but it was still um, an historic event. So there are quite a few factors um, that contribute to the rental growth being um, under immense pressure, and I'll walk through them with you now. So there's always a demand side and a supply side with these things. And if we look at the demand side, affordability is uh, obviously, um, and not surprisingly, a huge factor in um, rental growth and the demand for rental properties. A lot of this is due to the fact that many tenants, many households lost their income or at least part of the income um, during lockdown. And they simply can't afford large rental increases. They aren't necessarily looking to move into a larger, more expensive property. Um, so all of this uh, puts downward pressure on, on price, the fact that there is low demand for rental properties at the moment. Then on the supply side, there are two factors at play here. Um, we've seen and hear heard from many of our clients that many Airbnb properties due to lockdown and due to the ban on travel, uh, many of these properties were standing empty those owners took them out of the short-term market and put them onto the long-term rental market, and this flooded the rental market with rental properties. The other factor, of course, is uh, due to the low interest rates that invest investors are buying properties, um, buy to let properties, and that is also obviously then going into the rental market and fueling the oversupply. So the low demand and the high supply both of these put pressure on rental prices. We don't see this changing in the coming year for the simple reason that both of these are quite inelastic over the short term um, and will take a while to change. Now, if we look at basically the same information, just quarterly instead of monthly um, for two years and we add a trend line, you can clearly see that rental growth is trending downward. Um, for most of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, rental growth, again, measured year on year, trending between 3 and 4%. 
Uh, it's worth mentioning that a year or two prior to this graph, rental growth was at six or seven percent. So even before lockdown, rental growth was under pressure, again, due to weak economic uh, circumstances of tenants in general. So if we now compare the average rental growth with KZN rental growth, um, you can see that the picture looks slightly different. Um, at the beginning of 2019, KZN um, rental growth actually outperformed the national level by quite a bit. Um, that changed dramatically after lockdown and um, in 2020, the last three quarters, there were three negative uh, rental growth quarters at the end of 2020, meaning that year on year, rent is actually getting cheaper. Putting the province into perspective uh, against the other provinces, you can see that KZN there is the third most expensive province um, in the country, even though uh, we saw some negative rental growth there in the previous slide. Um, five out of the nine provinces actually experienced negative rental growth in the last quarter uh, of last year. Western Cape still remains the most expensive province and also the only one um, with an average rent of over 9,000 rand. Moving on to arrears. And as can to be expected, this was quite a topic over the last year. Um, since many tenants, like I mentioned already, either fully or partially lost their income and there was so much uncertainty around lockdown and how long it's going to last and when people can go back to work. And this is why um, we see what we see on this graph. So at the end of quarter one, uh, it was announced that we'll be going into hard lockdown. Due to that, many tenants uh, stopped paying their rent in full and for that reason, the percentage tenants in arrears jumped to almost 25%. That means that one in every four tenants were actually in arrears during the second quarter uh, of 2020. That has now um, improved quite a bit to 20.9%. So we're not quite where we were before lockdown, but we, also, we are luckily a long way off the 25% that we saw in the second quarter. Looking at the other arrears metric that we look at, we look at the average arrears percentage relative to rent. So we see, we look at if someone is in arrears, how big is that arrears relative to his rent? And at the beginning of the year last year, pre-lockdown, it was at just below uh, 80%. That jumped up all the way to 105% in the third quarter and um, improved a bit in the last quarter to 96 percent. So both of these metrics are still not where they were before lockdown um, but I think it's safe to say that they they both peaked and they are recovering slowly. So why did we see the patterns that we did? So firstly like I mentioned if we looked at the the number of tenants in arrears or the percentage of tenants in arrears due to the uncertainty of lockdown and the um, cash flow they simply stopped paying their rent in full and then once it was announced that most um, people could go back to work on the first of june um, they then again started paying their rent and where they could paid off their arrears on the other side if we look at the average arrears percentage it's possible that um, that this metric peaked in quarter three, uh, mostly because tenants with low arrears who were able to clear their debt, um, if the tenants with low arrears disappears, then mathematically that average um, will, will increase a bit. So the remaining arrears is a bit more sticky. Um, if you think about it for this figure to actually reduce, tenants will have to pay their rent in full every month and on top of that, pay off their arrears uh, before that can improve and that in the current um, economic climate is quite difficult to do for many tenants. Then if we compare KwaZulu-Natal arrears with the national, you can see if we look at the percentage of tenants in arrears that KZN started on 21.7%, so above the national average of 194 
also peaked in quarter two and then that recovered to 23%, still above the starting point in quarter one and also above the national average of 20.9 at the end of last year. On the average arrears percentage, there is actually some good news. Um, KZN looks a bit better than the national average, starting the year on 75%, moving up to just over one month's rent. Um, the average arrears, and then that uh, declined back to 91% at the end of the year. So that at least is below the national average. Then third, we'll look at credit metrics. So just a quick explanation where these figures come from. Through the paper platform, our clients um, can do credit checks on prospective tenants, and these credit metrics are then pooled to give you the data that you see. So it doesn't necessarily track tenants in the system, rather it indicates that the credit profile of someone who is um, applying for a rental property. So they're not necessarily the this, this same group. So just keep that in mind. So if we speak of credit metrics, we take quite a few, um, quite a few metrics into account. We look at income, income growth. We look at um, how many tenants have a major delinquency against their name. So that could be notices, defaults, um, could be a, an account in arrears of more than three months. Um, so there are quite a few criteria there. Then we look at how much of your income do you spend on debt? That's your net income after tax. How much of your income do you spend on rent? The sum of those two give you affordability. So what is left after you pay your debt and rent gives you disposable income. And then lastly, we have the credit score, which is just the overall score um, indicating credit health. So if we look at these national credit metrics, you can see that there was a bit of a decline in some of these, for example, major delinquencies um, during the second quarter just after lockdown. But you can also see that most of these actually um, improved again to the end of the year. Just one interesting one to mention is the debt to income ratio. We know that um, interest rates last year dropped by three and a half percentage points. And you can see as this debt to income ratio drops, the what effect that lower interest rate actually had um, on a tenant's pocket. Now, if we look at the credit metrics of KZN versus nationally, I'm not going to stand still here for too long. Just want to show you more or less um, where the province, how the province um, fared against the national figures. So KZN had higher income than national. This was actually the second highest income out of all the provinces after the Western Cape. Income growth was slightly lower um, than national. Uh, here's some good news, fewer delinquent tenants, a lower debt to income ratio, which is also great. Um, KZN tenants spend slightly more on the rent um, as a percentage of the income and better affordability, but very much in line with the national average. Uh, better affordability also means that they had a larger percentage of their income uh, left after the rent and debt payments. Lastly, if you look at the credit score, um, at 643 KZN, two points lower than the national, but worth noting that it is higher than it was at the beginning of 2020. So why do we see improvements in some of these metrics? It's very possible that lower income tenants, so we know that lower income tenants were hit harder by lockdown, and it's possible that these tenants lost their income and then moved completely out of the rental market when they moved into family with family or friends. So they exited the market in the short term. That's why they're not applying and bringing the averages down. It could also just be that tenants are staying longer uh, because they can't necessarily afford more expensive properties. And because they are staying longer and not applying for new properties, um, people don't necessarily do credit checks on these tenants. 
few other possibilities is that maybe after financial hardship of 2020 um, and lockdown, uh, tenants realize that they don't need to spend so much money on booze and restaurants and entertainment, and they could possibly be thinking about their finances uh, in a more responsible way and maybe using that booze money to pay off some of their debt, which, which would be great. Uh, the lower interest rate obviously had an effect on the debt to income ratio and also um, yeah, brought that ratio down. And then lastly, I said we were expecting credit metrics to worsen. Um, and I'm really glad <laughs> that we didn't see that um, because with the low interest rates, many good tenants now actually have the opportunity to buy um, their own property instead of renting. So I was expecting these good tenants to leave the market, um, the rental market permanently. But as you can see from our stats, there actually are still good tenants out there. So that is a bit of good news for you. Then for the funnest part, the state of the rental industry survey, um, we did the first survey a year ago and then at the end of last year did one again. So just want to highlight a few of the findings for you here. 95% of people who took part works in the property industry, as you can expect. Um, almost 70% were either business owners or rental agents. And then 64% had smallish rental books, so less than 150 properties. First, um, first category, we looked at technology. Not surprisingly, 55% of uh, respondents said that the, the use of technology in their business increased during COVID. That should come as no surprise to anyone. Then 70% said that virtual viewings and 3D tours are here to stay. And I must say, personally, I've seen many, many good virtual tours and 3D tours. Um, so this technology is available and this is a possibility for this to stay. And then lastly, 69% said on productivity, it is more productive to increase automation than to increase the workforce. That is basically working smarter and not harder. Then looking at the rental portfolio in general, 70% of people said that the rental increases that they put through in the last year was lower than normal. This was quite a, a shocking one for me, 93% of respondents said that they actually made payment arrangements with tenants, which indicates just how many tenants actually lost um, at least a part of their income during COVID. 55% said that they see more vacant properties now than they did a year ago. And 64% said that they have lowered their commission during the year in order to keep a landlord. So this is a bit of a problematic number just because commission income is your main income in any rental business. And once you've lowered that percentage, it is quite difficult to get a landlord to pay a higher um, percentage commission going forward. Then looking at challenges, 51% of respondents said that their single biggest challenge is to find good tenants. And 86% said that their biggest worry for 2020 is the ongoing effect of COVID. Lastly, and I'll end on some good news. Uh, the last question of the survey was how optimistic are you about the future of the rental market? Only 5% were pessimistic about this, 17% uh, said they were neutral, and then a whopping 78% said that they were actually optimistic about the future of the rental market. I looked at the previous year's survey results, and only 62% of people said they were, they were optimistic about the rental market. So maybe COVID made everyone think a little differently um, about their businesses. That is all from me. If you want more information about rent arrears, credit metrics, and some other cool stuff, you can download the Rental Index. I'll drop this link in the chat as well. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jan now. Thank you, Yuet. And, uh, and uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I've got a bit of a distortion. Juet, can I ask you to switch your camera off, please? 
Thank you. Well, good afternoon, body, uh, everybody. It is absolutely our privilege and our pleasure to participate in this uh, exciting event. So a special word of thank you to Amasi, Tracy Lee, Carl, Ben, the rest of the team at Private Property for allowing us this exceptional opportunity. And thank you, Yuhet, for all your insights. Um, ladies and gentlemen, for today, I'm not going to be doing a presentation like Yuhet has done. I think, should I have done that, I should have titled that Death by PowerPoint, because today I am going to look at something else that is a little uncertain, just like the economy and the rental yields, etc. And that is the Property Practitioners Act, and more specifically, the regulations to it, that we are not 100% sure when those are going to be published or promulgated. As you all know, the Property Practitioners Act, the Act itself was promulgated or published on 3 October 2019 already. That being the case, uh, you may be wondering why we as estate agents are still working in accordance with the old Estate Agency Affairs Act of 1976. I think we'll all agree that this 45-year-old piece of legislation is overdue for replacement as it dates back to an era before the internet, before digital marketing, social media, and very importantly, also before automated and integrated payment platforms such as PayProp. The old act simply does not cater for today's realities. But considering the new Property Practitioners Act, we must remember that this act in itself only sets out broad principles of the new law, and it does not speak to implementation thereof. And that is where the regulations to an act come in. It sets out the implementation and the application of the act once it's been promulgated. Now, although the act was published in October 2019. The regulations have not been finalized or published yet, but we know that it's coming. Once it's, it has been published uh, in the Government Gazette, the Act will be implemented and we'll all be working in accordance with the new Property Practitioners Act. When is that likely to be? Well, we don't know, but we do know what the final draft regulations state. And without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. I just want to show you certain extracts of the Act. If I can share this, and I'm not going to read it at verbatim. Uh, it will be too time consuming, but let me just point you to a few clauses. Uh, share, there we go. And firstly, I want to show you Section 54 of the Property Practitioners Act. That is where we learn what the intention of the legislator is. Now, most of you, or probably all of you, will be familiar with Section 32 of the Estate Agency Affairs Act that deals with trust accounts. Section 54 of the new Act is very similar, slightly more detailed, but it still says that every property practitioner must open and keep one or more separate trust accounts. You must appoint an auditor. You must notify the authority, which is the EIAB. It will have a new name. It's going to be referred to as the authority. That you need to notify them of things. And then there are many must-dos and must-dos. It's in different languages, so I'm just going to skip a page. And the property practitioner must do this and must do that. And it's not different, not very different, very much different to what you are used to. What is, however, very different in this new act is to be found in an earlier article or section and i'm going to jump to section 23 of the same act so 54 deals with the old provisions as was depicted as were depicted in section 32 of the old act 54 replaces those but then section 23 earlier up in the act needs to be considered and that makes mention of certain exemptions uh, in respect of accounting records and trust accounts. Now, when we consider this, and it starts off uh, a little awkwardly saying that a property practitioner whose turnover is below 2.5 million rand must cause his or her or its accounting records to be subjected to an independent review by a registered accountant subject to certain provisions. Now, that is materially, materially different to 
the current situation where every property practitioner or every estate agent must have a trust account and it must be audited by an accredited auditor. So already we can see that something is different here. And reading subsection 2, 23.2, uh, sub 2, the minister may by notice in the Gazette determine circumstances under which certain property practitioners may be exempted from keeping trust accounts. And the minister may by notice in the Government Gazette determine a different dispensation for the review of accounting records for those property practitioners. So Section 23, we can see that the intention of the legislator is that certain estate agencies can be exempted from firstly having trust accounts and secondly, then they don't have to have their accounts audited, but they can only have it independently reviewed by a registered accountant. Why is that important? Obviously, costs, time, and lots of administration that you don't get paid for. So. Um, I'm not trying to give legal advice. I'm simply pointing out in the act that has already been published, there is, um, there, there is an indication that the intention of the legislature is to exempt certain agencies from keeping trust accounts and having them audited. Now, that was the intention. So in the draft regulations that were published in 2020, this is where we will find the details. And I'm jumping to that. This is published. It's available on the internet. Section four, or it's actually regulation four to the Property Practitioners Act that deals with exemptions. And in these regulations or draft regulations, we can also find the template documents that one has to, to complete in order to follow a prescribed procedure when you want to apply for the exemption from keeping trust accounts and having it audited. Now this is quite comprehensive. I just want to show you that it actually actually exists and you will now know where to find it. Specifically look at the contents of draft regulation 4, more specifically 4.4 .4, and I'll, I'll scroll to it now and that has to be read with sections 54 and 23 of the Act where the intention is clear. But let's have a look at these uh, regulations. So it says, pursuant to the provisions of section 23, the following is prescribed. A property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if he meets certain conditions. And there are quite a few, I'm not gonna stand still on the details of those, but it's all reasonable, it all makes common sense. And if you have followed all those, um, it's pretty much the contents of section 23 and 54, which I showed you earlier, then subject to that, you can be exempted. Uh, and if you are exempted in terms of this regulation 4.1.1 above, provided that certain other things are in place, you as a property practitioner will not be required to again have an account review or audited. Sub, uh, regulation 4.3 says where a property practitioner is exempted in terms of the above and has complied with certain other things, such property practitioner will be exempted from having to have his business and other accounts audited and will only be required to have such account independent reviewed by a registered accountant. No longer an auditor, no longer a formal audit, far less time consuming, massive cost-saving opportunities subject to you meeting the criteria. Now, an estate agency has to be otherwise compliant and all these procedures need to be followed. I don't want to give a legal lecture on that. Please obtain the legal advice. Make sure that your, that your auditors are aware of it and then consider the most important aspects which are to be found in subsection 4.4. And that says that a property practitioner will further be exempted. So the further probably relates to the fact that you have a dormant account or that your income is less than 2.5 million rand per annum. So if you are bigger, if you run a bigger type agency, you may further be exempted from operating a trust account if you are otherwise compliant and then subject to regulation 4.4, which says that you may apply for exemption 
if you have mandated one or more other property practitioners that specialize in collecting and distributing trust payments. Such property practitioners will be called payment processing agents, and that is a company like Piprop, to Piprop to, to process your trust payments on your behalf in respect of all trust funds received by you. So should you use a property practitioner, Piprop is a property practitioner, that is an accredited payment processing agency, you can apply for exemption from keeping your own trust account. But there are further requirements. Looking at 4.4.2, your payment processing agent, in other words, your service provider like Piprop, has to operate a trust environment itself. So it has to be an agency and it has to operate a trust environment that also complies with all this act and all the associated regulations. Then 4.4.3, if I scroll that up, each payment processing agent, that is your pay prop kind of service provider mandated by you, must operate within a trust environment separately auditable client accounts, both in respect of each property practitioner, in other words, each estate agency, to whom it, to whom it provides a service, and in respect of each client of each such property Practitioner. So we're talking a trust environment by your payment processor, an entire environment that is auditable as a whole. Then we're talking about separately auditable client accounts, in other words, for each agency such as yours. And then we're talking auditable, auditable client accounts for each landlord and each tenant. Segregation of funds is what, what we're talking of here. And then lastly, the trust environment and each of these separate accounts needs to be audited annually in compliance with the Act and the regulations. And if all those criteria are met, an agency can apply for exemption, which will lead to time and cost savings. I'm delighted to say that Payprop has been in compliance with this for the last 16 years, even before these uh, regulations were drafted. I'm going to stop sharing quickly. And what is important, I think it's a little good news amidst all the other uncertainties and although it's still uncertain when these regulations are going to bring the Act into operation, I think there's a lot of relief for smaller estate agencies, startup agencies and those agencies who have been using fully compliant uh, property uh, payment processes such as Paycrop, and I think that is a bit of good news in all the uncertainty that's around us. Cost saving opportunity, safe auditable trust environment with um, proper audit trials, assistance with your audit, and hopefully that will assist many agencies amidst these uh, difficult working conditions. Thank you, Tracy Lee. I think that's it from me. Touch. Thank you so much, Jan, um, for taking us through the act. Let me know in the chat if you found some of what Jan was sharing this afternoon useful. Okay, so Tanda Zile said that she had a problem she can't hear or see, or he can't hear or see. Please accept my apologies if I get it wrong. Jan, there are a few questions here, but I believe your head is answering directly. Um, I would like to thank you so much for your time and wish you a wonderful afternoon. We'll connect again tomorrow morning and for the rest of the week while we bring these Nexus events to the industry. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Awesome. Okay, and so there was a question that uh, received already six votes. It's from Solly. Solly asked, what advice would you give a first time property investor? So I'm going to ask that um, my colleague, Carl Vandenberg, who is the private property business development executive, he's going to come onto the stage and he's going to give us a glimpse into what the future holds for private property and as, as well as what true industry partnership might look like going forward. So while we, that question um, that Solly's asked, 
what advice would you like what advice would you give a first time property investor i'm going to open that question up to everyone in the chat what advice would you give a first time property investor please put your chat or put your responses in the chat and then call over to you Thank you, Tracy Lee, and um, hello to our extended power property family. It's an absolute pleasure today to be able to, to spend some time with you. We obviously are an organization that's very used to the physical world and interacting with yourself, so we, we've absolutely missed um, talking to you guys. So this is why we've done Nexus in short. So um, thank you again for everybody for joining us. Thanks for Nusha from ABSA, um, our banking strategic partner, as well as Jan and your head from, from PayProp. It's a, it's a lot of information that we've shared today. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone's taken some notes. Um, today, I'm going to be covering really prop tech, where private property is currently and where it is that we're going. And then I'm going to ask uh, Celeste to join us. Um, and she's going to really run down what it is that we're seeing in a KZN perspective. Those of you that don't know Celeste, She's our provincial head and looks after KZN, Garden Route, Eastern Cape, and the Freistart. So let's get cracking. So, so who is private property and what are we choosing? So essentially, we're choosing to be a trusted partner in, in the real estate ecosystem. So what do we mean by real estate ecosystem? It's really quite simple. Because on the one side, you've got consumers, and those are the people that are looking for properties, whether it's to rent or to buy. And on the other side, you've got our partners. So our partners are property practitioners, banks, mortgage originators, um, and, and the likes. So this is a, 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 an interesting place to be, and we sort of do walk quite a bit of a tightrope because we need to balance the needs of both a consumer as well as, as a client. Um, and if we start sort of leaning more to one side, let's so as an example, if we start leaning a little bit more to what real estate needs or what real estate wants, we run the risk of alienating our consumers. And there's 57 million of these people um, that we, we can engage with. And so what happens is your consumer really just starts voting with their feet and that they find other avenues um, to get their information and to do their property purchasing. And it's likewise on, on the, the other side. So if we listen a little bit too much to consumers, we run the risk of alienating our clients. So it's a bit of a balancing act, but we choose to do this. And it's, it's a really, really good place for us to be. We've been in this business 22 years, but one thing we know is what the way business was done 22 years ago, the way business was done a year ago is fundamentally different to the way it is now. So if we have a look at, at the next slide, we start talking around how is it that we're going to be a trusted partner? And it's really quite simple. It's we choose to be customer obsessed. And customers, again, our consumer and our clients, we need to know our clients and our consumers incredibly well. What are their needs? What are their pain points? Once you understand that, you can start solving real problems. And we're choosing to go on this journey. It's a fundamental shift to what we've, what we've always done. We, we're essentially going to move away from being a that solves consumer and client's problems through digital solutions. That's the, 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 the snapshot of it. Once you understand the first two, then you start creating valuable propositions. And that's really the, the, the route that we're going to. Um, where are we now? Well, right now we are currently averaging 3.2 million consumers every, uh, every month. A year ago, we were averaging 2 million. 24 months ago, we were averaging only a million people. And our five-year ambition is to hit the 5 million mark, and we're well ahead of that. So we're incredibly proud of what it is that we've been able to do in a fairly short amount of time to bring more people onto our portal that chooses private property to look at your properties. And we've done that through a few things. One of them is our social media activity. You would have remembered um, when we rebranded a year ago that we went really, really big into social media. We do several podcasts a week and we've got almost 700,000 people engaged. Where are we in this five-year strategy? 2019 was really around us preparing around what is this new pilot property going to look like. We're pretty much a brand new team at an exec level, and it was really our time just to figure out what is it that we're going to do for, for pilot property and our clients alike. Last year was a big year besides COVID. We also started March or started the year with a complete rebrand. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we're no longer the, the red, black, uh, red, blue, and white colors of the past. We're now green. It's more than just a rebrand and how it is that we look. It's also how it is that we show up. How do we communicate? What products and services do, do we give to our clients and our consumers? 2021 is a watershed year for private property. 
technology. It is the year of innovation. It is the year of digital change. And it's the year that we, we've been planning for the last 18 months around it. So we're in a, in a cusp of really being able to revolutionize what it is that we do for, for real estate. And I'll share a little bit of that now. Um, as you can see the next slide, I can't even remember being those colors anymore. We are very much a new private property with a new way of doing things. Um, it's taken a lot of people by surprise in terms of how it is that we, we've changed. And everybody that Uh, I think we're frozen a little bit here. Lost sound and picture. Carl, are you there? Studio, do we give Carl a few minutes or ask him to refresh possibly? Or while we wait for Carl, can we maybe bring Celeste onto the stage? I believe uh, Carl van den Berg is frozen. Carl needs to sneeze. Thank you, Ken. Let's give Carl a moment, of course. In the meantime, while we bring Carl back on, <laughs> good one, good one, Ken. Um, there we go, Celeste. Welcome back. Welcome to this afternoon's Nexus session. Your microphone is, I think, on mute, or is it not? Are you okay? I still can't hear. I know. Can I can absolutely hear you. Let's give Carl a couple of minutes to log in and lo uh, log out and log back in again. But in mm -hmm. the meantime, if you can just take us through the KZN, you know, what's happening in, in, in KZN from a portal point of view. Perfect. So um, while Esty's get, while Hesty's getting those slides, um, getting to those slides, um, I'll get onto that now. So I just um, first of all thank you, Tracy, for introducing me, and um, good afternoon to everybody in KZN. It's absolutely awesome for us to be able to connect with you after this a very long dry spell of not being able to connect. Um, what I'm wanting to do this afternoon um, is go through the performance, uh, the performance for the region. I just have a disclaimer. These are the performance results for the entire region. OK, um, and we just need to be mindful of that. What I'm going to encourage you to do is when we are done with the presentation and you are wanting to possibly drill down a little bit deeper into your specific area of operation, that you get in touch with your relationship manager and we set up a meeting to connect with you and, and we will be able to go through data that is more specific to your area of operation. Um, so I just wanted to set that up up front because we know KwaZulu Natal, uh, the kingdom of the Zulu is a huge uh, region. Um, so this is, is a general overview for the performance for the region. Okay, so what I'm going to do is because there are many graphs and slides, I'm going to turn my camera off at this point, um, just so that you can get a, a bigger picture of the, the slides. And I promise I will be back as soon as I've, I've done, but uh, you, will, you will be able to hear me. Okay. All right, so the first slide that we're going to have a look at is the sales performance for KwaZulu Natal uh, for the period 2020 and 2020, or oh, yeah, uh, 2018 up to 2021, up to and including uh, February 2021. Um, as you can see, there has been an exceptionally positive growth um, in the views and leads for the portal from a sales uh, performance perspective. This in spite of a 5% drop off um, in the January, February um, time frame uh, for 2021 and against 2020 of the previous year. So again, we are seeing really positive results in the sales performance, uh, sales listing performance um, sector. Um, with, I mean, for views, we've increased by 37% already for the new year and 16% um, in, uh, in terms of leads. Right, moving into the rental space, the picture is a little bit 
difference. Um, and despite an increase in the number of listings um, and views, we still um, we still are seeing an, an, a decline or a negative sentiment with regards to leads. Now, um, it is not as great as it is in some regions, um, but the, it is still a negative. However, in saying that, it is indicative of the market in general when it comes to, to rental listing performance. Okay. What we are going to have a look at now is the top 50 searched suburbs for sales in KwaZulu-Natal. Okay. It is interesting to note that a large percentage of these searches, I know Venusha alluded to it earlier on, and it's interesting when we listen to our colleagues and the, the um, data that they present, um, if we have to overlay it, it, it almost speaks to each other, it would speak to each other. So um, as Venusha alluded to, uh, it is interesting to note that a large percentage of these searches are for the coastal properties. Um, could this be suggestive of semigration and the move that allows you to work and do life where and when you choose or how you choose? We don't, it, it seems so. So very interesting. It's interesting to see that uh, of co these coastal regions are fetching um, a lot more interest um, in terms of searches. Looking at the rental space, also, um, for the top 50 for KwaZulu-Natal, again, a lot of coastal uh, properties and very much uh, um, your central convenient points. Um, <laughs> yes, great start in Venusia. Um, so, yeah, again, as I said, as, as a caveat when I started, this is a general overview of the statistic or the data or the performance overview that we, we've seen for the region as a whole. I would love to be able to come and sit with each of you who um, in your area of operation and dive a little bit deeper um, into what is happening in these specific areas as they reflect on the, on the, on the top 50 searches. Um, what we are also seeing is um, in terms of, in the next slide, we'll see the median uh, listing prices uh, over from January 2018 right through to January, uh, February 2021. Um, you will see that from a sales perspective, KZN is, is um, tracking above the national average. Um, with a, and we've actually seen a 5% growth year on year for the period January and February 2021 against January and February 2020, um, which is encouraging. Um, and from a rental perspective, even though there's been a slight decline in terms of uh, the the rent, the median listing price, it is still tracking above the national average. Um, we our findings were that for the period January February 2021 against uh, 2020, there was a decline of nine percent in the um, median listing price for rentals. Um, Yes, I look forward to seeing you, Ken. Um, then, lastly, um, that's pretty much what we have to share today. I just wanted to take the opportunity from my team at, at Private Property um, and the greater team at Private Property to thank you for your continued support. We would not be able to have, a, have had achieved these phenomenal results without your support. Um, and despite um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic and what it has done, um, to many of us, I, I am still optimistic. I'm a, gla a glass half full kind of girl. You know, when Venusia said in the uh, in her presentation, "Strike while the iron is hot." Let me put my camera on. Um, my hand got very hot because I entered this industry and this market at a time when interest rates were 24 <laughs> percent. Times are very different, but very much the same. It's, uh, you know, we, we asked that question in Menti, what is 2021? Um, yes, it is tough, but you know what? We are tougher. So I'm optimistic. 
Um, I look forward to meeting you all face to face um, soon in the, in the near future. Uh, take care and stay safe. I hope Carl is, is okay to come back on. I think he is. Thank you so much, Celeste. Thank you for your awesome. insightful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, what happened there? Were you, what, what I'm happened, back. Huh? I'm back, I'm back. I suppose that was the equivalent of falling off stage in a, in a real life presentation. So apologies, but I seem to be back. I'll keep my camera off for the time being. Uh, okay. Let's see how I can recover from that. But uh, let's, uh, I think, yes, yes, that's the slide I last remember speaking to. Really, I suppose, the point is this, is consumers have completely changed how it is that they engage with property, how they learn about property, how it is that they view property all the way through to purchasing it. We know, and it was mentioned, I think, by your head earlier on, there's a big drive around consumers um, wanting to see virtual reality, Matterport, and all the rest of that. And really, that's about creating efficiency. So have a look at the property, research the property, understand if it's going to fit the needs, and then go through to the real estate agent. Which bodes well, right? Because I mean, I know a day in the life of a real estate agent, if you do a new listing and you get 500 leads in a day, how are you ever going to get through it? And our goal really from Power Property is how do we give you guys the tools to really be able to understand this and separate a, a shopper from a buyer? And that really just talks to around um, building a, a modern platform. So you're going to see us in the next couple of months. I said 2021 is our watershed year. And it's our year of, of absolute technology and being able to, to do a lot of things quite differently. So in a couple of months' time, we're going to be going live with two new um, sort of digital platforms, one that is purely based for consumers. So in other words, those people that are shopping and wanting to buy property or rent property, they're going to have a completely different app as well as web where they can engage with your properties, search your properties, find information and connect with real estate agents. And the next level of that is a client portal, and that's for yourselves. And that is a better way for you guys to interact with private property. How do you understand the trends? Like what Celeste and, and our other partners have been sharing with you today, how do you access that information? How do you understand your market share? How do you understand the sales prices in certain areas? So that's what we're going to be de developing uh, in the next couple of months. We're incredibly excited about this. Um, and it's something that's really, really going to create a huge amount of efficiencies for both yourselves and ourselves. So really, really looking forward to it. An example that we had from the Nexus this morning is how is it that we can link a qualified buyer to, the, uh, to, to a real estate agent? You know, imagine the power that you would have as a real estate agent that when somebody comes to you and says, I want to view that property, that you know that they've really got an, a pre-approval from EPSO, that you know exactly which house they're looking to buy and which area they're looking to buy and do they have 2.5 children and a dog and a cat. And that's really what it is that private property is striving to get to. To get to yourselves. We'll obviously share a lot more information around this because there's going to be a bit of change management and we'll build this new portal and this new industry together. So we're incredibly excited about it. The last point is this is you know we, we talk about digital technologies we talk around and we often use the word disruption and I fear that disruption has gotten a really really bad name to it. So a lot of people view disruption as sort of cutting out the middleman or in our case you know, going directly and linking buyers and sellers to get uh, directly together and cutting out the real estate agent or, or this and the next thing. That is an element to disruption. Power of property sees it very, very different. So there's a couple of things that we know. One, property ownership in our country is highly emotive. It's the, sec it's the biggest thing that anybody is ever going to purchase in their lives. And there is always going to be a place for the human being in it. And the human being is yourselves. What we need to use with technology is, again, giving you guys efficiency for understanding the problems that you have and giving you the solutions. And that's really the journey that private property will be going with yourselves in, in the next couple of weeks or well, next couple of months uh, until we really get to that place with that, that we've got absolute efficiency. So thank you again for, for joining us today. I, I hope that this was quite informative. I hope uh, we I'm still online and everybody can still hear me. I'll come back onto the stage and if there's any further questions, we'll happily answer it. Thank you so much, Carl. I think let's put your microphone on mute while we scroll through our chat box and see if there are any questions for Carl, specifically around his presentation today. And uh, I think, Celeste, you've already engaged in this chat box here and dropped your email address. 
so that uh, anyone on the call right now, you're more than welcome to reach out to Celeste and she'll be happy to take you through the specifics of your area. Um, and that could be a 20, 30 minute conversation, but having that uh, opportunity and wanting to use as much information and insight to help guide buyers and sellers and investors. I think that's really the, the sort of, that's what partnership really means for private property. So I'm gonna quickly read through um, some advice here. I, I did put one of our questions that we had been asked, which was um, what advice would you give a first time um, property investor? And um, we've got a couple of responses here. Um, I think Templeton, you you offered your advice as well. Um, and then Tracy Dunn, advice, know what you're wanting out of the property, e.g. is it a rental income? And then Ken, you've also given us some of your, um, some of, oh yeah, heads up for the presenter. It's not sure if it's the same for everyone. Your audio cuts out temporarily when you swap large to thumbnail video in fact we've actually took taken video off completely because of the impact that it has on the network so thank you so much for that um i think solly we've taken a stab at answering your questions you're more than welcome to stay on and network further with us here today thea you asked uh, i know Thea's not in the room right now but she asked or he asked if we could send a, a copy of the presentation i believe your head you've already done that your head i also believe that you've already sort of answered why potentially the kzn market is so expensive in terms of rentals i believe that you've done that on or answered that question um, I think for the la last few minutes of this presentation, I'm going to end it off with um, another mentee. If you're still in the room, please take out your cellular phone, go to menti.com, enter in the code and put in your name. And then we'll quickly run through, uh, I think it's only a few questions here, but it's really good for us to just get that um get that insight from from you while we have you in the room with 92 people still in in this in this meeting today in this nexus today i think let's spend two three more minutes quickly just looking at menti studio thank you for dropping it into the chat that code again is four five six two eight one three seven all good for those that had to unfortunately drop off but like we said uh, before, this presentation will be made available. Please bear in mind that Nexus will run until Thursday. We will only be able to send out those presentations once Nexus have been, this Nexus have been concluded, which is Thursday. So let's get into Menti right now. And at the end of Menti, I will announce the winner of the most engaged person and the best question. Hashtag... Uh, You'll be at the edge of your seat for that one. All right, studio, let's get into Menti and let's answer those questions. We're just waiting for Menti. Emmanuel, you've dropped. Is that your? Okay, thank you. We'll wait for Thursday so I can explain to colleagues. Okay, which part of the country new buyers are investing in the most? That's a question from Solomon. Um let me see if there's anyone, perhaps can 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 someone, one of our guests uh, answer that question. Which part of the country are new buyers investing in the most? Uh, let's see if there's someone in the in the um, in the meeting here that will be able to answer that question. Studios informed that we're just waiting for Menti. Um, Let's give it a couple more minutes. Oh, Emmanuel, that's your advice for first time um, investors, property investors. All right, we'll click on that. Um, let's see, all right, how long do you think the rental market will, re will take to recover? Of course, we've uh, just heard the presentation by PayProp. One to two years is the overwhelming sentiment longer than two years and less than two years those were the options but by far one to two years 
is what the consensus in the room is around how long it will take for the rental market to recover. Let's move on to the next question, please, studio. We still have quite a number of people in the room. Are you experiencing an oversupply of rental properties in your area and uh, not applicable? Uh, there was a no. There's um, okay. There's quite a number of no's, and uh, let's give it a few more minutes. Leanne, I see your comment here. We have seen an increase in sales in the Belito area. That's from our sides, Chaz Everest, Everett, Everett, KZN North Coast. Also, an influx of inquiries. Okay, so 18 of you saying that you've not experienced an oversupply of rental properties in your area. It's very interesting. Let's move on to the next question, and then we will end the session today and give you an opportunity to connect. Venusha, thank you, Venusha from APSA. She has given us a response to the question that Salman, Sal, Salman posed. And she says it will be region specific. First time home buyers in KZN have a keen interest in the CBD precinct as well as our coastal areas. Is it harder to find good tenants since COVID hit? 13 of you saying yes, no, almost like nine of you saying no. And again, one person saying not applicable. Let's move on to the final set of questions now. What what are the most important aspects to your business right now? Is it signing mandates? Is it expanding your brand with more franchises? Is it building your leads list? Or is it building brand awareness? And look at that immediate responses telling us that signing mandates and building brand awareness seems to be the most important aspects that you're focusing on in your business at the moment. Let's give it a few more minutes and then move on to the next question. And of course, while I have you here, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for engaging with us on these uh, private property nexus events that we have uh, put together with a specific focus with re into your regions. Stock, 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 everybody. That's what Ken is saying. Uh, let's see if we've got another Menti question. Once COVID-19 passes, will you be going back to the office? Uh, yes, no. Wow, look at that. Uh, there's a yes. There's a stronger, uh, quite a few yeses coming through. A, a bit of un uncertainty as well, as one can imagine. Um, I think for us, from, from a private property perspective, we uh, have made the decision to remote work until we are able to possibly even move into smaller satellite offices around the, the country. But um, for now, safety first, right? And uh, overwhelming majority of you saying you'll be going back to the office. I must say I do miss seeing my colleagues every day i miss the chats at the at the water fountain let's go to the next question for menti it's a bit of a, a question just will you will you will you be getting the vaccine once the vaccine have been okay look at that very very interesting a lot of people still haven't decided um but yeah i think i fall into that I haven't decided category let's see how how uh, how the whole thing works out but quite a number of you already deciding it's a no um yeah let's move on to the next question and we're almost getting to the end of this monday afternoon edition of private property nexus in partnership with apsa bank and specifically with a focus on kwazulu natal um, how do you expect COVID-19 to impact your earnings this year? Majority of you saying more income, some saying less income, and others letting us know that you anticipate almost the same income or no impact. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. 
We really appreciate it. Emmanuel, I see your comments just come in. A lot of businesses have realized a massive saving by working from home, cutting out the huge rental expenses from prior to COVID, uh, prior to COVID. And then the final question, I believe, Studio, let's wrap it up here. In the event of a third wave, should there be a third wave, what would you do differently to minimize the impact on you or your business as much as possible? And the options were, uh, I think the options are wrong for this particular, okay, less income, more income, some income or no impact. Okay, what would you do differently? Okay, so you, so I'm, I'm going to assume then that having more income will buffer you against the impact of a potential third wave or any other wave. I think that's it. That brings us to the end of the private property nexus in partnership with APSA. I'd like to thank the speakers who joined us today. Um, Venusha, thank you so much for your energy and your time. Thank you as well to your head and Jan, and of course, Carl and Celeste for joining me on this virtual stage today. I'd also like to end by saying that Carl Alban, you have our best question prize, and then Templeton Masinga, you win the prize for most engaged today. Um, someone from our team will be reaching out to the both of you um, just to say thank you. I want to thank you, um, Adina Swanapool. Thank you, Tracy Dunn. Thank you so much for your comments and thank you for participating in this uh, private property nexus. I hope next time we can switch a lot more of the cameras on, bring you up on the stage, have more conversation. Tell us what you think. Maybe if you can just drop a green heart here in the chat box. We'd really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Studio, we are leaving the session open for the next 20 minutes so that you can, um, so that our guests can still network and communicate and converse with each other. Um, remember, if you want to move from table to table, you're more than welcome to do so. And then the final two links that we're going to put in the chat now, the first one is um, the link for you to get your one and a half uh, non-verifiable CPD points from Aisa. Thank you, Aisa. Let's paste that into, into the chat box. And then if you don't subscribe to our newsletter currently, we have an industry newsletter. We have lots of interesting information that come through from the different brands and also what you know, interesting things we're doing on Agent Connect on the Facebook page there. We often run webinars. We are very, very keen to stay connected to you, like Carl was saying. So I'd like to thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you for your effort. Thank you for your energy. We, I think we did pretty good for a Monday afternoon. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and hopefully we'll get to connect again soon. Bye-bye, everyone.